In the name of Jesus Christ, let me give you all a very warm welcome to another week of online ministry from Newton Ard's Reformed Presbyterian Church. I'm especially glad to know that our own church family is watching and following along, but I do want to give you a warm welcome if you're visiting with us in this way and format. Our call to worship comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 35, verses 3 and 4. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, Be strong, fear not, behold your God. Behold your God. And that's what we want to do in the time we have before us just now, to behold our God together. We're going to read now from the scriptures a couple of passages, one from the Old and then one from the New Testament. So uh, Psalm 139, we'll read from first. Psalm 139, and then we'll be going to Acts chapter 17. So firstly, Psalm 139, reading verses 7 to 12. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. And then a reading from Acts 17, the book of Acts chapter 17. And we'll read a little, uh, a little of a longer passage at this point. Acts 17, 22 to 34, verses 22 to 34. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God, and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, We will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst. But some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. God's word. <clears throat> 
We're coming today in our next sermon on the attributes of God to think about the omnipresence of God, the fact that he is everywhere. Now, omnipresence is not a word you'll find in your Bibles, but it's a good word to have in your vocabulary. It's likely that you will hear it from time to time in Christian circles and meetings. No doubt you'll come across it in Christian books, the fact that God is omnipresent. And there's a number of his attributes that begin with that little word, omni. Uh, it's a Latin word, omni, uh, and it means all, all. So some of you children, uh, you will have heard of herbivores, carnivores, and omnivores, omnivores. And that refers to an animal that eats both food, uh, uh, that eats for food both meat and plants. And so many of us, we're omnivores because we eat all kinds of food, all omnivore. And when we say God is omnipresent, he is all present. So after considering the immutability of God last week, the fact that he is unchanging, we want to again dive into what is another vast ocean of a doctrine. Uh, we want to plunge ourselves into the omnipresence of God. We're going to see, God willing, along the way, uh, that this is an immensely practical and helpful subject. We're also going to see how how wonderfully timely it is for life today. So let's consider then five aspects, five truths, or five aspects of this truth, uh, the, the omnipresence of God, five aspects. We're going to look at it and turn it around and we want to look at five points together. So firstly, this is a considerable truth. This is a considerable truth, and that should go without saying, shouldn't it? Uh, this is not a pocket-sized, compact characteristic of God we're thinking about. His omnipresence, it, it's colossal. God is not just merely a big God, he's, he's uncontainable. As Paul writes, he fills everything in every way. He's a spirit, you see, and because he's a spirit, he's able to be fully present everywhere. He isn't limited to a particular place. He isn't, he isn't bound by circumstance. He isn't contained by anything. There are no limits to his presence. Now, we struggle with the limits of our minds to really fully understand this, and we should be careful uh, to avoid a few errors. We must not think that God has somehow spread himself everywhere, just like someone spreading butter on a slice of toast. God's omnipresence isn't like that. Uh, nor is he engaged in a cosmic game of twister, trying to stretch himself between an infinite number of locations, as if here, there's some parts of God and there's some parts of God uh, somewhere else. No, it's not like that. And nor is he using some advanced form of multi-site locational software. Uh, this is what some mega churches in America have going on. Multi-site churches. And before COVID-19, they were all over this. Each week, the pastor would turn up at an unannounced site, one of the churches, but, but he wouldn't announce it beforehand. He would, he would appear at this church and a hologram uh, of him would appear at the other locations. That's not what's going on with the omnipresence of God. As if he somehow cloned himself, multiplied himself into an infinite number of gods so that he's somehow present everywhere. Not, not at all. Uh, those would be false 
wrong understandings of the omnipresence of God. And there just aren't many good analogies or illustrations that help us here. More often than not, they tend to confuse us. And we would just do well to let the truth of the Bible be sufficient for us. It teaches us that all of God is in all places at all times. So let me say that again. I've tried to state it as simply and succinctly as I can. All of God is in all places at all times. All of God in all places at all times. So in the truest possible sense, God is here, there, and everywhere. Now, he's not always present in the same place, in the same way. For instance, in heaven, his, his love is more evident, but in hell, his wrath is more evident. So uh, some of his attributes are more clearly seen in one place than in another. But nonetheless, the truth remains. All of God is in all places at all times. Now, there are uh, lots of places in the Bible we could turn to for, to help us here. But there are three places in particular where this truth is laid out very simply for us. Uh, Psalm 139 is one of those places. We've already sung from it. We've read from it. And it's all about uh, the attributes, the character of God. Verses 7 to 12 are all about his omnipresence. But as you sung those, as you sang those words and, and as you read them as well, did you notice how comprehensive David was when he described the presence of God? Listen again to it. Uh, verse 8. If I ascend to heaven, you are there. In other words, he's above us. If I make my bed in Sheol, the grave or hell even, you are there. In other words, he's beneath us. If I take the wings of the morning, verse 9. So if I look to the east, where the sun rises, you are there. If I dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, the sea was to the west for writers in Bible times, you are there. Verses 11 and 12, even in the darkness, you are there. North, south, east, west, up, down, dark, light, he's there. And we didn't read on, but if you did, you would find that even in the womb, he is there, omnipresent. Jeremiah 23 is another passage helpful here. Jeremiah 23, verse 24. Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord. Or Acts 17. Verse 27, he is actually not far from each one of us. So do you see, this is a considerable truth. The God of heaven and earth, he is omnipresent. But let's touch this down into our lives in the remainder of our time together. And let's think secondly, this is a contrasting truth. It's considerable, yes, but this is a contrasting truth, secondly. Contrasting. That is to say, this is another of those unique attributes of God. It's one of those characteristics that define him and him only. Incommunicable attributes. It's one of the ways God is different from us. Because we're not omnipresent, are we? Any parents of young children will have no doubt said something like this to their children, no doubt several times maybe in the last few weeks. I can only be in one place at one time because it's impossible to, to divide ourselves in two. 
Uh, and we might describe someone perhaps as having one foot in both camps or or her heart isn't in it or he's present in body but, but not in mind or I'm a divided soul. But that, that's not omnipresence, is it? That's, that's distraction. Uh, we're, we're just not fully involved in what we're doing. Uh, human beings, unlike God, we are bound to being in one place at one time. No matter how advanced we might become, uh, you might be able to work remotely in these days while keeping an eye on the children, uh, while having the dinner in the oven, and you might have time to, to browse Amazon or your social media, but you're still not omnipresent. You're not omnipresent. We might call it multitasking or working efficiently, and we may well be, but I've been challenged this week on this by, by some of the thoughts by Jen Wilkin in her helpful book on these subjects. She makes the point that we're living in an age of distraction, a multitasking culture uh, that, that struggles to focus on one thing. We, we spread ourselves across so many tasks that, that often nothing is done really well. Uh, so that we're rarely fully present where we are. Uh, far too often, we're trying to be omnipresent uh, and our hearts are divided. Uh, and, and a smartphone is largely to blame, isn't it? Uh, on one device, we can communicate with someone across the world. We, we can follow a recipe for dinner. We can airbrush a photograph. We can book a flight. We can read a blog. We can like a photo, all in a matter of minutes. Uh, and don't get me wrong, uh, phones are of course a great blessing, particularly at the minute. But, but who are we kidding? Who are we kidding by trying to be all things to all people? trying to, to somehow be omnipresent. We are not omnipresent. God has made us, designed us as human beings with clear limitations. Uh, the martyred missionary Jim Elliot uh, once told his sister in a letter home, wherever you are, be all there. Isn't that helpful? Wherever you are, be all there. In other words, don't spend all your time wishing you were somewhere else. Don't spend all your time wishing you were doing something else. Wherever you are, be all there. God does not expect you. He does not ask you to be omnipresent. He remembers we are dust. And you may have all sorts of pressure in your workplace or in your home or in your church, perhaps, or in your family life. But you can only do so much, especially at the minute. That's something God's teaching me at the minute. That you and I, we cannot be everywhere. And in a world that's constantly seeking to be in every place, wherever you are, be all there. Whether it's reading your Bible or having church at home, be all there. Whether it's reading a book to your children or talking to your spouse, be all there. Whether it's your employment or your service to the church, be all there. Your studies, your having dinner with your family, be all there. Do you see, this is a contrasting truth. God is omnipresent. We are not and we cannot be omnipresent. Wherever you are, be all there. This is a contrasting truth. Let's think thirdly then, this is a convicting truth. This is a convicting truth. You'll all know that we're living in a world full of increasing camera surveillance. 
In 2021, we're told that there will be one billion surveillance cameras watching the world, more than one for every seven people. These cameras, you'll be able to find them on streets, on buildings, on lump posts, and they'll have the ability to recognize and identify uh, individual faces. Uh, you might have even gone into a shop and you've seen that sign saying, you are being watched by 24-hour CCTV. And the idea is, of course, that cameras are a deterrent against crime. And the surveys confirm that uh, they, they do seem to be quite effective. People restrain themselves when they know they're, they're being watched. People restrain themselves when they know they're being watched. And the thing is, friends, there's no amount of surveillance camera that, that can come close to the all-seeing eye of an omnipresent God. Nothing we do goes unwitnessed. We are never all by ourselves. Hebrews 4 verse 13. No creature is hidden from his sight but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. How this, how this convicts us, friends. The things we do in secret, the things we do in private, when we think no one is watching, he is there. And there are some sins that Christians commit in the presence of God and they would never dream of doing them in the presence of others. Your secret porn habit. Your private, anonymous, incognito internet browsing. What do you get up to with your boyfriend or girlfriend? What do you watch on TV when everyone else is away to bed? At the filling in of your tax return. Uh, the stealing of someone else's work and passing it off as your own. What you do in your most private moments, you're not alone. The omnipresent God is there. And this truth, it's seriously convicting. David realised it with his secret sins and, and the whole cover-up effort. At Psalm 51 verse 4, he wrote, Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. God sees. He, he's present. He, nothing is hidden. And for the unbeliever, this truth should be just as powerful because you know, friend, you know deep down there is a God. Uh, you might have heard the story of, of an atheist who in his living room had, had written on the wall in big letters, God is nowhere. God is nowhere. Uh, and his little son was playing one day while, while he was reading his newspaper. And the small son was learning how to read. So he tried to read this sentence on the wall. God is nowhere. But nowhere was, was rather a big word for this little boy. So, so he broke it down in two. And he read, God is now here. God is now here, Daddy. The father was shocked. He had never read the sentence that way ever before. And his whole perspective changed from God is nowhere to God is now here. Maybe your perspective needs to change. Maybe you need to realise that God is now here. Acts 17 verse 27. He is actually not far from each one of us. You can't run from him. You can't hide from him. Instead of being like Jonah who tried to run in vain away from the presence of the Lord, you need, like the prodigal son, to, to run to him. And just in case, and this is quite heavy, this is quite solemn, just in case you think that dying 
would somehow free you from the presence of God, that, that you would be able to escape him. You should know God is just as present in hell as he is in heaven. I can assure you, you will not find any atheists in hell because God himself is there. God is carrying out his own vengeance on the unbeliever. At Revelation chapter 14, verse 10, he, the unbeliever, will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Those in hell only wish they were away from the Lord. They only wish they could escape his presence. So I urge you, seek the Lord while he's near today in all his tender mercy and inviting grace. This is a convicting truth. So it's considerable and it's contrasting and it's convicting. In a fourth way, this is a comforting truth. A comforting truth because no matter where you are, God is there. No matter where you go, God is there. No matter, no matter how you feel, God is there. No matter what you've done, God is there. This is not the case with the devil. Satan is not omnipresent. He roams around like a lion looking for someone to devour, the Bible says, but he's not everywhere present. Only God is omnipresent. You can't have a better God than this. Joseph would tell you he's a, he's a God who's in the pit with you. Daniel would tell you he's a God who's in the lion's den with you. David would tell you he's a God who's in the valley of the shadow of death with you. Peter would tell you he's a God who's in the storm with you. I could go on and on and on. What a comfort to know. We are never alone. God is with us and even, even better friends. God is in us. God is in us. Uh, this is something that's very helpful for us to consider. Uh, this is where it helps us to look at this attribute through the lens of Christ. Mark Jones, another helpful writer, says this, Omnipresence finds its focal point in the person of Christ. In the person of Christ. You see, in becoming man, Jesus never ceased to be God. In his being present here on earth, he never stopped being omnipresent. Uh, he is Emmanuel, God with us. And do you know, there's only one place in the Bible about which it is said, he is not here. Only one place about which it is said he is not here. Today's a big clue. The empty tomb. The empty tomb. He is not here, the angel said. He is risen. In his human nature, he's not in the tomb. And after his resurrection, what did he promise his followers? End of Matthew. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And by sending a spirit, our helper, our comforter, we can say that in every adversity, every trial, every storm, God is really and truly with us. He's in the trenches with you. No matter how you feel, whether you sense his presence or not, he is not far from any one of us. And we would do well 
to make the same realization that Jacob made. Genesis 28 verse 16, Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. Uh, you can't say that about anyone else on earth. No husband, no wife is always with you. No friend, no pastor, no counsellor, no angel can replicate this. This is a most comforting truth, the omnipresence of God. One of the most powerful paragraphs in John G. Payton's autobiography and describes his experience of hiding in a tree. I've shared it with the congregation before. Uh, the year was 1862. Hundreds of frenzied natives were hunting after his life, and a friendly chief urged Payton to flee under cover of darkness and to climb up and hide in a big tree. And up in the tree, Payton could see and hear the natives beating the bushes, frantically searching for him. And he writes these words. I heard the frequent discharging of muskets and the yells of the savages. Yet I sat there on one of the branches, safe in the arms of Jesus. Never in all my sorrows did my Lord draw nearer to me and speak more soothingly to my soul. Alone, yet not alone. My comfort and joy sprang from the promise. Behold, I am with you always. Alone, yet not alone. This is a comforting truth. Comforting truth. And then a fifth aspect to consider. This is a COVID-19 truth. This is a COVID-19 truth. The days of COVID-19 in which we're living, they are difficult days to say the least. Days of social isolation, social distancing, days of lockdown, days of loneliness. And how we need this truth today, friends. God is present everywhere. He is in all of God, is in all places at all times. And though we may be separated from our parents today, or our children today, or our grandchildren today, though we might be separated from our friends, uh, maybe a boyfriend or a girlfriend, no one living on this earth, no one is separated from the presence of God. You cannot socially isolate yourself from him. You can't be socially distant from him. Some of you have, have loved ones in nursing homes and, and care homes today, uh, and the visiting restrictions are, are very difficult. Uh, some of you have loved ones in hospital today and it's very, very difficult not being able to visit with them. Some of you have been bereaved in recent days and the funeral restrictions are so very difficult. Some of you haven't had a proper face-to-face -face interaction with another person in weeks. Take yourself to the omnipresence of God. Isaiah 41 verse 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I am with you. God is actually not far from each one of us. Some of you, you're serving and working on the front line. Doctors, nurses, midwives, essential personnel, delivery drivers, and on and on and on. You should know as a church family, we're proud of you. We're praying for you. But what a truth this is for you. 
as you put on your protective clothing perhaps, uh, as you're perhaps concerned about the unseen dangers of the workplace, you should know God is not far from each one of you. And Christ our Saviour says to all of us today, I will never leave you or forsake you. And we can say back to him, Yea, though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And this week we've entered, friends. Let's love and worship our ever-present Lord and Saviour. And if not yet a Christian, friend, seek this Saviour who is not far from each one of us. Let's pray briefly together. Let's pray. Gracious God in heaven, we thank you for that day when the angels said, He is not here. He is risen. And O oh Lord, we bless and praise you for the risen, ever-present Lord Jesus Christ. And this truth of your omnipresence that, that fills everything in every way. O oh Lord, forgive us for how we can so often be divided and distracted. Help us to be, to be children of yours who are fully committed to the responsibilities that are right in front of us, that wherever we are, that we might be all there. Uh, oh Lord, would you convict us with this truth? Uh, Lord, help us to, to, to know and remember you are always with us. Uh, even in our most private moments. How this comforts us, O oh Lord, that we're never alone and we're never isolated. And O oh Lord, in these days of coronavirus, Lord, we thank you that though we may not be able to interact with one another in the same way, you are fully present with all of us. And God, we bless you and praise you for this truth. We have only we're only paddling in the shallows of it uh, today and we ask that you would fill us with this wonderful knowledge that we might say like Jacob, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. Lord, impress this upon us, we ask, and strengthen us by your Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.